On the last program, we talked about how to become a child of God and live forever in the new heaven and the new earth. Today, we're going to talk about what happens when you die. Do you go to the grave or do you go straight to heaven? Begin with today, Jeff, why do you think so many people avoid the subject of what happens when you die? And are there absolutes in our world? David, my opinion is that talking about our own death is painful. It tends to be foreboding. I think it is natural that we all worry. Is the Bible right? I've had the faith, I've repented, and I'm going to go be with Jesus, right? Everybody else who has died has neglected to come back and tell me how wonderful it is. Well, everybody except Jesus. He did come back, and he was effusive and detailed about what we can expect. Now, considering the second part of that question, are there absolutes? Of course, our birth is an absolute. Now, here I am. Death is coming. That's an absolute. But let me give you an absolute from the Bible that ought to really, really worry those who haven't gained the faith. Those folks who are wavering. Those folks who are worshiping in another religion. By the way, a fellow without faith in Jesus' grace, a fellow who thinks he's doing some things right, some good, he might say, hey, I don't criticize. I give $10 to the Ronald McDonald House twice a year. I'm way better than my neighbor down the street who cheats on his income tax. Sounds like I'm good to go. This gentleman doesn't quite grasp the faith the Bible is asking us for. Now take a look at John 14, 6. I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, now there's an absolute. Well, we can't struggle with the first two absolutes, birth and death, but we cannot to ignore the Lord Jesus himself and his telling us that one of his absolutes inviting us along with him to have eternal life. Jeff, you did a good job explaining about absolute truth, that Jesus is the author of truth, the Bible tells us. Unfortunately, in our society today, our school children are taught that there is no absolute truth. They call it tolerance. They say, my truth is just as important as your truth, and so nobody's truth is more important than anybody else. But as you explained, Jeff, that Jesus is the absolute truth, and there are some things in life that are absolute. Let's talk about a, a different topic. Orpa, if you would, tell us about in what ways we're made in the image of God. Well, we do have a spirit, and God formed the spirit within man. It is with man's spirit that mankind identifies with God, for God is spirit. Man bears God's spiritual image. The soul, the spirit of a person, is the immaterial part of one's being. Man's soul belongs to God. We're told in the very beginning, in Genesis uh, 2-7, it says, God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and this man that he's making, Adam, became a living soul or a living being. Thus, man bears God's spiritual image. Man is a rational, moral, free agent. Man's soul is the most vital asset that he has. A man's soul possesses immortality. The spirit is a man's immaterial nature, the center of emotions, the source of passions, the cause of uh, volitions, that is, the act of exercising one's will, or the ability to make choices, such as have faith, love God, sin, or prosper. The spirit is subject to divine influence as well. The spirit has reason, has conscience, is capable of communion, relationship with his maker. The soul or spirit leaves the body at death. As I said before, the soul possesses immortality. While we're in our physical bodies, we cannot see God. But in a new spiritual body fitted for life in the spiritual realm, the faithful will live in God's presence. The scriptures you referenced to point to our spiritual body living in God's presence after death. That's a wonderful hope that we have as Christians. Yes, mm -hmm. he is our blessed hope. Yes, he is. Jean, where did the Old Testament saints go to when they died? David, I'd like to answer that simply by reading a few scriptures from the Old Testament, from the New King James I'll start with Abraham, Genesis 25, 8. He breathed his last and died of good old age, 
an old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. Now think about that for a moment. He was gathered to his people. Verse 17 says, These were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. And then in Genesis 35, 29, it says, So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. And then in Genesis 49, 29, speaking of Jacob, it said, He charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. And then there's Numbers 27, 12. Now the Lord said to Moses, Go up into this Mount Abraham and see the land which I have given to the children of Israel. Verse 13 says, And when you have seen it, you also shall be gathered to your people as Aaron, your brother, was gathered. Deuteronomy 34, 5 and 6 says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. So it's obvious then that he prepared a special place for these Old Testament saints to go and wait till the time when Jesus could come and redeem them. And we could also see that God is the Father of Spirits by going to the New Testament, like Hebrews 12, 9 says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? So God is the Father of spirits. And then in verse 23, it says, To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. And then I'd like to read one more, David, in Matthew twenty-two thirty-one 31 and 32. It says, But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So this shows plainly that they did not cease to exist at death, but they continued to live until Jesus came and redeemed them. Thank you for the comments you made there, Jean. Let's transition to the New Testament from the Old Testament. The Bible tells us in Romans that the wages of sin is death. We're all going to die. And Gene had talked about the Old Testament saints, that they were going to be gathered in Sheol, a holding place for the dead, to wait till Jesus paid the penalty of their sins so that they could go to heaven. So Tammy, when is that going to happen? At what point are they going to be taken up to heaven? When Jesus died on the cross... The scripture says that he ascended into hell. And what he did then was he went to the place where the people were gathered and he preached the good news to them because in the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints looked forward to the Messiah. And in the New Testament, we look back to the Messiah, what he did. So they were credited as righteous because of their faith, looking forward to the Messiah. So after he had paid their debt, he went into hell, into Sheol, and proclaimed the good news to them. And he unlocked the doors of death and sin because he had conquered it. And it says that he led them into heaven. He took paradise with him into heaven. So they are there today. At the point when Jesus died and he went into Sheol, he went into heaven, taking them with him at that point. Gene talked about the Old Testament saints. Tammy, you talked about what happens with the New Testament saints. So let's talk about what happens today when a child of God dies. Peggy, can you fill us in on that? Well, I was a unit secretary at the VA Medical Center in Lexington for years. The station where I worked was very close to the patient rooms. And when we had patients on the floor who were dying, I was very close to the patient's families and uh, calling their ministers, calling their priests for them, praying with the believers. 
And it was really noticeable to myself and to the nurses involved in patient care that the believers were much more comfortable with the thought of death. Although they didn't like the thought of death, they were much more comfortable with it than the non-believers. The non-believers were really uncomfortable with the thought of death. And another position I had at the VA, I filled out the paperwork after the patient had died before releasing the body to the funeral home. And I could see a big difference how the believers handled death and how the non-believers handled death. They had that assurance which gave them so much peace. Although they were going to miss their family member, they were still really much more peaceful with the thought of death because they knew that they are going to see their family member again in a restored, healthy state, and they would be united with them. Hebrews 2 says that Jesus came to destroy him who holds the power of death, and that is the devil, and to free those who have been held in slavery by the fear of death. What a wonderful, wonderful outlook Christians have. That's true. Recently in my own family, my wife's mother died. In the last year of her life, she had studied the scripture diligently. We're confident that she died and went to heaven. That's really reassuring to know that one of your loved ones is going straight to heaven when they die. She had that same confidence that you were talking about. and You said you saw it in some of the patients you dealt with. I'd like to end up today with just reading a couple of scriptures from Revelation 21. In uh, Revelation 21:12, it says, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. So not only do we have the hope of heaven and all that that entails, but God also says there's a little bit more incentive in there. He's going to give each and every one of us a reward when we get there too. It doesn't say what it is, but we will have some kind of reward. And then let's go to verse 17 in chapter 21. This is the last chapter of the Bible. The spirit and the bride say, come and let him who hears say, come and let him thirst come. So Jesus is inviting us all. Jesus wants us all to be there. And I hope that through this program, we have created a thirst in the people listening to our program that they want to go to heaven, that they have a thirst for that. He says, the Spirit says, come and let him who thirst come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. This is the last chapter of the Bible. Throughout the whole Bible, God has constantly told us about his love for us. And this is almost the last verse in the Bible. And God is still saying, If you want the water of life, I will give it to you freely. So I'm talking to you out there who might be listening who aren't saved right now. If you want to be saved by Jesus Christ, it is because Jesus has willed that you want to be saved. If it's in your heart, God has put that willingness in your heart. If you're not saved yet, but it's just begun in your heart, if there's a germ there that wants to be saved, depend on the fact that God wants you to be saved. If you're concerned about Christ, He's concerned about you. Jesus says it's your duty to believe and He wants you to come to Him. He says whoever wishes, let Him come. That does mean you. It doesn't say that you have to pray about it first. It doesn't say you'd better go home and get your life straight. He says come right now and take the water of life that I freely give to you. We know that salvation is a free gift and this is a special invitation to you, listener. If you're willing, come and drink of the salvation. Believe that Jesus Christ is able to save you right now. Trust your soul in His hands. You don't have to prepare for it. Just ask God to save you. To take the water is simply to trust in Jesus Christ. If you're willing, God has made you willing. Well, what a blessed hope we have in Jesus Christ. Tune in to our next broadcast and hear our panel discuss on preparing for eternity.